Welcome everyone to today's video. So the next thing that is missing in our fancy DOS stuff is making some good sound. We quickly initially already had this OPL2, OPL3 FM synthesis, but for more sophisticated audio and sound, we want to play digital samples. So for this, most people had a sound blaster if they didn't have a Curvis ultrasound, but today we want to focus on the sound blaster. So there is some excellent programming stuff and actually when I was eight or 10 or something, we already did this programming in DOS when it actually was state of the art. There are some sound blaster revisions. In this video, we do not take a look on all those details. In this document, you find everything needed for all of this. And what is different, so, so far we have done IO port programming. This is what you see here, the addresses here. This is IO in and out. And interrupts to get notifications when something happens. And the next thing that we need to do for this is DMA. So today we want to also use this old fashioned Isabas DMA controller to play some digital samples and program all of this. You see things become more complex the more we look into things. So here is digitized sound IO programming. There are some different formats, 8-bit, 16-bit, um, even some values you need to decide what, what you want to use. And you can read all these details here. I will not repeat all of this in the video. Here we reach the actual real stuff, the DMA mode programming single cycle. It will DMA one cycle, then it will stop. You need to reprogram it. There is a risk that you hear a gap and some clicking. Auto initialized mode came later, not the early sound blasters do not support this. You can use this for also with double buffering, so you can update the buffer while it's still playing. This is actually what we will be doing. So today we will only use the most advanced auto initializing double buffering mode, but I will make it quick and simple. And then there are DMA modes. And actually this later sound blasters even have two DMA channels, one for 8-bit, one for 16-bit. Totally crazy, complex, annoying stuff. Here you see what is supported. So the first sound blasters only could do 8-bit mono, single cycle, auto initialization came later. And then only the latest generations had 16-bit support, mono and stereo actually, by the way, the first ones were mono only. Stereo came at version three, sound blaster pro or two or whatever. And only the very latest ones Sound Blaster 16 later could do 16-bit and also in stereo. However, they will have duplex. I think you could only do 16-bit recording or playback and then 8-bit the other of this mode or so. Whatever. Anyway, so to program this, this comes in here later. So general procedure for DMA transfer, set up the interrupt service routine, program the DMA controller, program the sample rate, program the DMA links and start the transfer, service interrupts and when you're done, restore the original routine. So you basically only need to follow these guidelines here. Turn on the deck speaker for digitized output. You're out to the address D3. Turn off, turn on. Set up the time constant. Actually, this, this is for the early ones. Later, this became better. And if you need to output 16-bit things, output low byte first, high byte later. And there are different commandos for PCM in, out, compressed, and so on. First, you need to reset the GSP. Write reset to port 2x6. This is a base address, so if it's 220, then it's 226 hex. Wait three microseconds, write a zero, and then pull for reading AA in the read port. So, this is the kind of things you need to do when you directly program the hardware. And now let's do it. So, actually, I have already done all of this. This is a program, my usually DOS stuff, our headers, our DOS header stuff. And let's go straight to the main function. Main function starts here using our just established new ArcC, ArcV stuff, because later we want to play nice audio files. So here's argument parsing uh, that we can later extend upon. Right now we only accept the file name and try to open the file name. For this, I even edit file open stuff to the DOS header that was not there yesterday. So now we also have file open. For this you can look up your regular DOS interrupt 21 for file open that is uh, somewhere here. File open using handle 3D. 
you find 3D here, mode and string to the A and D register. Here A is a mode and DSDX is a ASCII zero terminated file name. The only special thing is arrow on carry flag, somewhere it is written here, file handle if carry flag not set. So we jump here if not carry to this local label and otherwise store the error to the DOS error variable that we have here. I also wrote the close function. We already had the write function for the printer screen. I improved this slightly for the carry flag error handling. And we also have a read function now that we did not have before. That is here, read goes 3f, so 3f handle dsdx for the buffer. But the actual programming, so sound blaster reset function, so as we just have read here in this document, writing to the DSP and resetting this there, we write to the base port plus 6, 1, we use sleep a little bit. This use sleep function is right now a little bit very preliminary. This needs to be better timed later. May not yet work on real hardware, works in DOS box, but I already have this factored out into nice function, so we only need to improve our use sleep delay for all the later use later on. So write 1 to reset, wait 3 microseconds, write 0, and then read until we have AA. Uh, we have this already factored out into an SB read, which is looping. So we have here SB read until the status port has the high bit set and only then we do the actual read. So we can reuse this SB read. Same goes for write. This functions try 100 times and error out. And also here try 100 times if the write port is free and only then write it out if the last bit is set for being able to write. So after we have reset the DSP, and of course I go through here relatively quickly, you can watch it slower or you can download the source code that I published and read all the documentation here, MIT, Education, Sound Blaster, PDF that you probably find also somewhere else. So next we need to set up the interrupt vector. This took me quite a while because I forgot actually that the hardware interrupts I had here 5 or 7 doesn't matter, we later need to get and fear this blaster variable. Right now this is hard-coded. The problem was, after 20 years, I forgot that these interrupt vectors for the hardware interrupts are offset by 8. So I debugged this forever, why it doesn't work, until I came back to figuring out that this hardware interrupt controller is sending these interrupts to interrupt vector 8 and up. So this small details can take hours to track and debug, so you always need to double and triple check and read all the documentation and if something doesn't work, debug, debug, read more details and so on. This is also something I implemented malloc here, those malloc. So for small allocations this works, but we need a huge buffer for the DMA and with internet search it looks like it should work, but somehow it doesn't. Maybe this is because we are running as a stupid com executable. I currently do not know if someone knows why this doesn't work. Ideally, we want to allocate here um, 64K. But as a workaround right now, we run in remote in DOS without memory protection, so we can just use any memory. So I just use here a 256K, and I hope and pray for the best that it's not used. Usually it isn't. And this works for now for our demo. But Later we want to figure out why these huge allocations do not work. I hope this is not related to COM executables because if it would be then this would mean that we can never do bigger allocations in our GCC compiled COM executables. But yeah, this is stuff for later. So I test fill the memory here with a sine wave just for testing, but I already implemented reading from a file. I will show you this later in a second. So if we opened a file here at the beginning with FD assignment from open, the file the user supplied here. Only then we load the frame here already. The load frame function is also used from the interrupt vector. So it gets the file descriptor and the offset in memory and the size. Later we will not use the whole size. This is using our far pointer abstraction to the DMA buffer. We read in 512 chunks because we run in remote and only have 64k segments and we also need space for code and data. So we cannot read the 64k buffer as a whole. We could however theoretically optimize this 
Right now I manually copy this. Very theoretically we could make a special DOS read function and not use our data segment and instead use the far pointer directly and change the data segment and have the read function directly write to this far pointer address. That would be way more optimized, but I wanted to save this for a later date. Right now this manually copying works and you also do not always need to make everything the most optimized to begin with. You can micro-optimize this later. So right now using our normal functions and normal far pointer abstractions and this just works. So read this. If there's not an error, then copy this with the far pointer. Later in the interrupt service vector, again, what I showed in the last video, we cannot do complex stuff here, so we need to call our non-inlined more complex function for the stack not to be mangled here. And here in our interrupt service routine proxy here, beside printing a helpful message, we load the frame and we program the interrupt so that we get an interrupt for every half frame to use double buffering and load the other half that is currently not played. So this is frame ended by one, so the last bit decides which frame it is, the odd or even frame, and we decide here the offset is half of the buffer, so the offset is either zero or half of the buffer, and we obviously fill and read the other half of the buffer to the actual programming. And what is really nice is that it's, it's relatively simple. The next thing that we need to do, and this is also one of the things that can take really long to track down, by default this interrupt is masked in the interrupt controller. So you can Google the spec for the interrupt controller. Basically, the mask is here in the interrupt controller register at this IO port 20 plus one for the mask register. And we read it and mask here our Song Blaster IRQ, which is five or seven or whatever. And we add this mask to the mask so that we can receive the interrupts. The small details that easily take you an hour or two to figure out, plus another hour or two for the interrupt offset here that I mentioned earlier already for the offset eight. The small details that hold you up an hour or day or two when you write an operating system to get all the details right everywhere. So back to the programming. So we enable the speaker that was seen here already somewhere. So turn, you see here, turn on the duck speaker, command port D1. So what are we writing out here for the speaker D1? Then this is a modern output rate programming. The old sound blasters need some more time-based code. This is a new command for the direct sample rate that we write here, first the high, then the low part, then we program the DMA. I go to this in a second for the old-fashioned ISA DMA controller. Depending whether if it is 8-bit or 16-bit, this is either usually DMA 1 or 5. We still need to not hard code this. For 8 or 16-bit transfers of our buffer with our 64K size, how many samples fit into this buffer depends whether we are running with 8 or 16-bit samples and it's either not divided we use one or divided by two. And we want interrupts for half of the frame. This is why we divide this here by two additionally to receive an interrupt more often than the DMA is finished. And then we program here this commands you find here also, here somewhere. This is by the way the old time constant based programming. And then here's the commands C, what are we writing? C6 and you find all the commands here in the document. So this is playback, C6 for 8-bit playback or B6 for 16-bit output. This is, this are here some bits you see here, 24, this is input output, whether it is ADPCM compressed or raw PCM in single cycle and so on. You can look up this modes here, depending which modes you want to use. And also right here, whether we want mono or stereo and which kind of format, signed or unsigned and so on. And then the number of samples in the buffer that we calculated earlier. That is everything that was needed and DMA I factored out here into a DMA header. There are two DMA controllers that are for 8 and 16 bit transfers and the registers start either at IO port 0 or C1 for the second one. So 
I have here arrays for the registers depending on the DMA channel. So this is DMA channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this is the address count, page, and so on registers. This registers flip-flop disable mode and clear only exist once for the first and once for the second controller. So to access those, we index into this whether this is the first or second controller by shifting here the DMA channel down by two bits. So we index into this registers to write to the correct register that we want to use. Here is out B. First disable the channel, then the mode, single cycle, address increment. You can look this up in the DMA controller spec. The page register is the memory page. This are 64K uh, old-fashioned real mode segment kind of stuff. So you can not cross a 64K border with this additional page register nonsense. Then the DMA, if it is 16-bit transfer, these numbers are word. So we need to divide this by two or shift it on one bit. And then we write here the address, the size, and enable the DMA controller. And that's basically everything we need for this. So I tested and implemented this for mono and stereo 8 and 16-bit. So now let's try it out. For this to test, I converted here the flag files with socks. So I created here raw files with a rate of 44, 22, 8 and 16 bit mono and stereo. So only thing is that I will implement a wave file and command line parsing. Right now we need to recompile this, so 22 mono first. To play this we call your blaster with so this. So this is correctly playing the 22 mono file, 8-bit. These are the outputs here, file descriptor, sound blaster, interrupt service routine. Here is, this is a DSP version and copyright string coming out of the Creative Web sound card, the DMA settings, and then it's running. The dots represent loading each 512 bytes chunk from the file. These are the frame interrupts. And um, without a file, it will play the sine wave that we generate. Actually, this frequency is maybe right now quite low. Let me sign F. What did we do here? Um, P2 Hertz buffer. It's probably 512 Hertz, if that was correct. Yeah, could be 1K Hertz. So, to show you higher quality and mind you, so if we change this to stereo and 16 bits, this values change here. These conditionals are all coded here for the registers. And I really love, in a way, how simple and direct this programming was with so few lines of code. These are just 200, okay, 300 lines of code, where even with comments and stuff, you can program this vintage sound cards. In a way, I really love how simple this hardware was. So I need to check I have not test files for all of this. Next I had here 44k 8-bit, so we change this to 44100 and use here test 44. And this sounds already much better, much higher frequencies. Then we have 44 stereo, I guess, was this uh, 44, probably, so channels 2 and 44s. Also note that now the frame drops increment faster and faster. Initially, with 8-bit, we could fit over two seconds of audio into this frame buffer of 64K. As much as we increase here this parameter, the rate, twice as much is then already down to only one and a half seconds. In this buffer, stereo again half this frame time to then 0 0.7 seconds. And if we are now going to 16-bit, we fit 
much less again half into this buffer so we 64k divided by 22 500 is nearly three seconds even then stereo and then 44k we have uh, 0 0.7 seconds in this buffer and then 16-bit so we finish playing all the 64k in only 0 0.3 seconds and this of course increases the CPU demand and minimizes the time that we can spend loading the next part of the WAV file from the disk if we want to run this on a real 386 next. So 4416 we change this to 16-bit, let's see. Yeah, and this is now obviously CD quality. And you see these frames incrementing with a much faster speed there. So yeah, this is uh, the next step of our awesome GCC-based DOS code. And I hope you learned a lot of hardware programming, sound blasters, and with the theme of things here, you probably can imagine where we are going of all the hardware level programming in case you are interested how operating systems work, if you want to write your own low level stuff. And the nice thing is writing code like this, modern C, C++ code, we can share all this regular coded stuff. We can with minimal changes reuse wave playback on Linux on microcontroller. And this is really a nice thing to write programs like this high level and be able to share all the code. And I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly have. And later in the series, we can continue writing nice new stuff, either games and demos, and move this to microcontrollers and other architectures like writing low level code on PowerPC and Spark and have fun everywhere. So don't forget to share, like, and subscribe. And I hope to see you soon for the next videos to come.